Hey folks, Sheriff Lamb here. Welcome back to the PCSO podcast. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, Navita, and we're here with one of our supervisors, Supervisor Pete Rios. I've honestly been really excited about this. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to let Pete explain a little bit more, but we have, in the county, we have five supervisors, and they basically are like our city council and the people that help make the decisions and and the reason we're doing this podcast is because we want to talk about things, all things PCSO, or all things Pinal County, PCSO. We want to talk about businesses. We want to talk about law enforcement. Now, tell us, you're the uh, supervisor. Before we get into your background, you're the mm -hmm. supervisor for which district? I'm the supervisor for Supervisorial District 1, which encompasses the mountain area that we dearly refer to <laughs> as the Copper Corridor. A lot of mining up in that area. That's what they're, you know, uh, famous for. Uh, not as much as what there used to be, but still, mining is is the uh, number one industry. I also represent in District 1 Central Pinal County, which a lot of people forget. And I do represent where we're sitting right now, Florence, mm -hmm. Eloy, and Coolidge. Then I swing around and I pick up uh, Saddlebrook Ranch and Oracle, and from there I go to Mammoth and Samuel and Dudleyville and Winkleman and Kearney and Superior, and then back around and everything that's in between. But typically what's in between is a lot of uh, prison cells. Yeah. <laughs> we have a state prison, county jails, federal detention, and I supposedly represent the inmates as well. But clearly we all know they don't have any rights, so they never call me for anything, <laughs> nor does the county provide any services yeah. there. It's either the privates that provide the services to the inmate, the state, or the county through your office, of course. That's a big district. It's like if you, if For those of you who are familiar with Pinal County, that is a huge district. We have a big mountain range right in between that. Um, so you've got to do a lot of, that's a lot of traveling and a lot of... Uh, even though a lot of those are smaller towns, it's still a lot of area and people to, that you represent. Yeah, and, and initially, when, when I first started back in 2009 as a county supervisor, because I had been a state senator for over 20 years, they offered me a county car. Well, I wasn't used to using anybody else's car but mine when I was in the legislature. It's your personal vehicle. Yeah. And I was putting a lot of miles on my vehicle because then I represented a district that went from Oracle all the way to Avondale, Whew. from uh, the reservation, Indian reservation, north of um, Scottsdale, all the way south of Arizona City and everything in wow. between. That's a huge so I, I put a lot of miles yeah. on my vehicles. So when they offered me a county vehicle, I said, nah, I said, I'll, I'll just drive my vehicle. So what the first term, the first four, four years, my poor little 2007 Mustang, I put so many miles on that thing that I uh, eventually Going into my second term, I said, you know what? The county manager was leaving, uh, Fritz Baring. Yeah. He was taking a job in Scottsdale. I said, you know what? What are you going to do with your vehicle? And he said, I'm just turning it back to fleet. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> I said, how many miles you got on? It had about 90,000 on it. I said, I'll, I'll take it. So I use that vehicle now, so that really helps me get around the yeah, district without having to tear up my own personal car. So. Now you've had a long, because you mentioned the legislation, yeah. legislature. You've had a long career in politics, and I've been fascinated. I've been really excited to talk to you because you are a longtime Pinal County resident as well. Right. Tell us a little bit about you, Pete Rios, and then your your background in politics and and just where you what your background is in. Yeah, well, it, it, and a lot of people know me because I've been around for so long that a lot of people do know my background and where I grew up and and where I went to school and who I affiliated and associated with. But a lot of people don't know that as a kid, I was born in Hayden, Arizona. I was raised in Hayden, Arizona. But in the 50s, Hayden, Arizona was a very segregated mining community where Mexican-Americans lived on one side of the wash, white folk lived on the other side of the wash, and never shall the two mix until you go to school. And then when we went to school, the schools were over there. But in our barrios, and we call it San Pedro, where we, we were raised. And if you lived up the slope, they referred to that as San Miguel. So there was even rivalry in, in that <laughs> particular little side of town. But nevertheless, we only spoke Spanish. So when I went to school, 
And people would speak to me in English. I mean, I just look at them and smile. I had no clue what they were saying. So when my teacher would even ask me, what's your name? I'm going like, what does that even mean? What is my name? I've never heard that in English. If, if they'd have said in Spanish, como te llamas, I would have said Pedro, you know? But, and that's another funny story, because when I was in second grade, there was two Pedros in the class. And the teacher said, Pedro Rios? By then, I, I, I know how to answer that question. <laughs> and, and, and then the other one was Pedro Santa Maria. And then he put his hand up, and then she looks at us, and she said, can't have that. What? Can't have two Pedros in the same class. From here on out, you are Peter, she pointed to me, and you're Pedro. And I went home, I told my mom, I said, she just changed my name. <laughs> and, and then, you know, a, a lot of Latinos at that time do not want to challenge authority, and, and even today. And, and they have a lot of respect for authority, and they think that anybody that's in, uh, a teacher or an administrator, they're always right. So my mom says, well, son, she knows best. And I'm thinking, I like my name, <laughs> but nevertheless, so from there on it's out, stuck. I became, oh yeah, that was it. I, I was Peter, and then it got shortened to Pete in high school, and, and I just kept it. But, but nevertheless, it, it, it was a, a great learning experience growing up in that type of an environment, because I came from a very large family. There was 14 of Ooh. us and, and our parents. Equally, and where do you fall in that? Equally divided. Seven brothers and seven sisters. And I was number 13 at the end, okay. the, uh, towards the last. So by the time I was born, my older brothers were back from the war. They were already married. And some of them, after I was born, had kids. So I have nephews and nieces that are basically my age. So when we used to play on the school ground or out in the neighborhood, and they got a little rowdy. I said, hey, 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 you got to respect me. I'm your uncle now. Even though I was only a year or two old. And they hated it. It still worked. I only played that card on them so many times. But, but nevertheless, I, I, I was second to the last. All of us were born at home, even though we had a hospital there towards the end. And mom could have gone to the hospital. She refused. So she knew the doctor by first name. <laughs> Since she had so many kids. That she says, no, I'm not going. You're coming to the house. And he said, okay. You know, have somebody call me because not everybody had a phone in those days. So they would call the doctor and he'd show up and deliver the baby at home. You know? <laughs> so the last one, my, my, the youngest of the family, his name is Tommy. Uh, when he was delivered at home, the doctor said, I've delivered so many of your kids. Angela, that's my mom's name. She says, he said, I got to baptize one of them. I said, he says, I want to be this kid's godfather. So he became the godfather of my little brother. So anyway, That's it, cool. it was a great community to grow up in. Is it, your childhood home still there? No, it, it got demolished. It got demolished uh, uh, probably 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those homes in, in, in San Pedro and in Haiti, it's a dying community. There. The mine is still in full operation. They still have the smelter at a circle. Uh, but the community itself, uh, mining is good, and, and it's a good livelihood for a lot of people. A lot of guys, especially when they came back from the war, became carpenters, plumbers, electricians, through trades that the, uh, the copper mines offered. But we all realized that it was putting out a lot of pollutants mm -hmm. that are not good for right. human beings. Uh, people had to make a decision. Do we move away? and find another job, which was going to be hard to do, especially good paying jobs, because the mines paid well. I mean, everybody had a brand new four-wheel truck, uh, four drive truck, especially after a contract, because they knew they were good for another four years, you know, and they could pay off the truck. Uh, so they wouldn't leave. But the decision was made by a lot of families, including my parents, consciously, that even though we know it's not healthy to be living under and at that time, it was two smokestacks. Asarco had a smelter. Kennecott Copper Corporation had a smelter. And you know, this is where Dad works. And uh, he's not going to find anything better that's going to pay him what, what the mines pay. But nevertheless, it, 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 uh, it was a good area to, to grow up in. I went to Hayden High School. 
and because the student population was kind of low, uh, I mean, it wasn't a big school, got to compete in all the major sports, got to be in student government, uh, even though <laughs> this is something that, uh, that the uh, grocery magnet said, and he wanted on his tombstone when he passed Eddie Basher. Oh, yeah. And so. I was a bad boy. But I hope everybody considers me a good man. And that's, that's pretty cool. much where I come from. That's because cool. I, and you look back, and I'll, if, I'll, I'll refer to a couple of incidents. But uh, that, that's, that's the type of, of, of folk that came out of there. But in school, it gave me an opportunity, even though I did have some problems with your badge <laughs> as, as a juvenile, um, it gave me an opportunity to participate. And when I went out for football or basketball or baseball, they wanted me to go track. I said, I can't do all four. That's crazy. But I would make the team, right. uh, even as a freshman. As a freshman, I didn't play on the freshman team. I played on the JV. Towards the end of the season, they moved me up to the varsity. And it's like, hey, who hears of that? A freshman playing on the varsity, you know? So it, it, it was good recognition, but it gave us a lot of positive strokes yeah. that normally you wouldn't get in another school. So it, it gave me the idea, and it gave me the opportunity to know that I could succeed. Even though I had failed a couple of times, I could succeed. And even as a kid, once I learned a little bit of English, they had tracking back then, so kids were placed in, in the class depending on their ability, on how they tested. So they had tracks A, B, and C. Smartest kids were A, mediocre kids were B, the not so smart kids were C. I was always in the A class, and I always started making the honor roll. So that in itself gave me some recognition where a lot of teachers would give me more challenging work, and I was able to do it. So I appreciate growing up in a small town. I mean, I can talk about my experience for a long time, but I know you have other questions. Well, what led you to politics? Because how many years have you been in politics in the state of Arizona? Probably about 37, going on 37. That's a lot. Yeah. So how, how, what, at what age and what drove you to get into politics? Well, I mentioned that I had gotten in a little bit of trouble as a juvenile. You know, I pointed at your start. <laughs> I mean, I got in trouble with the law. When I was 15, I was driving my dad's truck without a license. Police officers. Which everybody me. did back then. Yeah, what <laughs> I care. But this particular one pulled me over and, and gave me a citation for, run, for driving my dad's truck without a driver's license. I mean, I couldn't get one. I was 15. So they set up a court date for me. And I had asked the chief of police, I said, does my dad have to go? He said, of course he has to go. You're a minor. I was more afraid of my dad than I was yeah. the chief of police yeah. or the court. Uh, but little did I know. And, 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 and then later, the chief of police saw me. Uh, I think I was going to the theater. And he pulled me aside and he said, hey, you know what? You don't have to bring your dad. You can go to court by yourself. I talked to the uh, magistrate. He says, you can go by yourself. I said, okay, cool, man. Thanks. You know? uh, well, I didn't know I was getting set up. So nevertheless, <laughs> I, I, I went by myself. And the chief of police started ranting and raving that I was out of control, that I was this kid that was a real incorrigible, and blah, blah, blah. So the magistrate said, okay, he says, your punishment is going to be 10 days in jail. Oh, and I'm thinking, 15 years old, dude, what are you thinking? And then he says, and, but if you work for the town, we'll give you five days in jail. I didn't say anything, and got me by the arm. The jail was next door. It wasn't un until I heard the iron door slam behind me that reality hit. And I'm thinking, this fool really did it. <laughs> he really <laughs> threw me in jail. And uh, I'm thinking, maybe he's just trying to be uh, part of this scared straight, and maybe he's going to let me out yeah. in a few minutes. Uh-uh, no such thing. He was serious. I spent five days in jail because I said, okay, I'll work, I'll work. And every morning, uh, one of the police officers would pick me up. I'd go work with the public works department out on the road, cleaning up brush and whatever. And then one of the guys says, hey, Rios, can you move the dump truck over here? 
I said, are you kidding me? I said, that's why I'm in jail for driving a car with not a license. You don't move the truck, man. <laughs> anyway. You were going to fall for that again. No, I said, heck no. But nevertheless, so, so when you ask what, what, um, what kind of motivated me to get into politics, it, that was one major incident that had a major impact on me because I knew of the injustice. And I'm thinking, I don't want this to happen to others. I mean, it's yeah. happened to me. I, I can take it. And uh, I mean, the reputation that I developed was was that of uh, people were afraid of me. People, or, I mean, the kids, because, oh, man, he's a con now, man. He's been in jail. You know? <laughs> but I try to do everything to show them, no, I'm not, man. I'm not a bad guy. I mean, just because I was in jail for five days at the age of 15, whatever. You know, kids, they, they yeah, live oh, in La La Land, you know. So and did that motivate you to get into social work? That motivated me to go to college. Because what, then, then I got in trouble another time. And then one of my coaches pulled me aside. Uh, and I was at that time in eighth, eighth grade going into high school. And he basically said, uh, sit down. He called me cabezón. Cabezón <laughs> means thick headed, you know. <laughs> sit down. And I said, what's up, coach? He says, look. You've been getting in trouble, and I know what you're trying to do. You don't like the way things are being run in certain places, and you don't like certain things the way they're taking place in school, and you're trying to change things. But the way you're going about it is the wrong way. It says, you might as well just go butt your head up against that brick wall, because that's all you're going to get is a busted up head. It says, you want to change things? You want to change society? It says, learn the rules. Learn the rules, but learn them better than anybody else. You want to play their game, and then they got nothing on you, especially yeah. if you learn them better. You know, that kind of, I thought it had gone in and out of my head, but it really stuck because then I spent seven days in Julie after I had been in jail for something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell the story, <laughs> but yeah, we're breaking and entering into a little grocery store there in San Pedro, right? It's five of us, our game. You know, took Levi's and albums. Uh, you know, we didn't have an A track music. Yeah, it wasn't A tracks <laughs> or cassettes or, or, or CDs at that time. It was um, maybe three LPs. Yeah. And then they had a, and we knew the guy that owned it had a case of beer in his walk in, so we took the case of beer. Nevertheless, we showed up back at, at our homes at uh, six in the morning. At 6 30, there's a knock on the door. It's police. So, so they take us to Juvie up in Globe. So they put us in solitary confinement in, in, in a particular cell, all together. I mean, not together, all in the same building, but in separate cells. And for six days, they let us out one time to take a shower. She had a lot of time to think. So one of the things that happened to me was, I'm thinking of what the coach told me. Because here I am again in trouble, and I'm not changing anything, uh, just making it worse for myself. So I, th I thought about what he said, if you want to change things and you want to improve society, learn the rules. I made up my mind on, at that split second that come hell or high water, I was going to go to college and I was going to learn the rules. And for me, the rules were the laws. So that was my first step towards knowing that I was going to get into some political office. I didn't know what then. But uh, that, that's pretty much what sparked me is, is those two incidents, the, the jail incident and, and then the coach telling me to learn the rules. And did you go to U of A? No. I, what I did is the year that I went was the following year that we're going to open CAC, but I didn't want to wait for another year. And this is back in 69. <laughs> the other thing that happened is I did a lot of things at a young age. By the time I was a junior in high school, I was married and I had a child. <laughs> My child's a state senator right now. But Which I met. I've yeah. met her a couple times, yeah. And a good kid. Uh, I mean, she's got a, a, a great head on her shoulders. But, yeah, uh, I asked my dad, I said, I got my girlfriend pregnant. What do I do? I didn't want to get married because I knew the school board had a policy. that If you were married, you couldn't play sports anymore. And you couldn't be in the honor society. You couldn't be in student government anymore. You could only go to school. And I told my dad, I said, all of this stuff, negative stuff is going to happen if I get married. I said, and they say the guy is going to get the same punishment as the girl because the girl shows 
the guy doesn't, but he's responsible for it. My dad just said, your child? Yeah. Need out? No. Yeah. He says, if that's your blood, you take care of it. So we got married. So nevertheless, so for, so from there, uh, I mean, it, it was like, okay, I want to go to college. I mean, I graduated from high school, so I worked a year and a half at the mines, build up a little nest, egg, I mean, a egg nest or whatever you call it, to some money, and I started going to school at Phoenix College, okay, because this one was not open. So I figured the transition from a graduating class of forty-four. To go to ASU that had at that time about 40,000, 50,000 students, I figured I'll go to Phoenix College. They only had 10,000. I was still lost. You know? but, but nevertheless, went there two years, got my associates, transferred to Arizona State University, got my bachelor's, went to work for the state for a year, then came back and went back and got a two-year master's degree in social services wow. administration. And then you did social services. How many years did you serve in the uh, legislature? How many I, will, I served 20 years in the Arizona State Senate and then four years in the House after the Senate because I had turned out in, in the Senate. So it was either go home or run right. for the other team. I never wanted to serve in the House. Um, I, I knew the folk that worked over there. As a matter of fact, we had a, a former Speaker of the House that had to run for the Senate and he won because he was turned out of the House. And then he wanted to go back to the house. I said, why don't you want to stay here in the Senate? Yeah, he says, you know, he says, it's like school and, and education. Oh, here in the Senate, you guys are too respectful. You address each other as senator. You're so cordial. You have all these rules. He says, it's like being in the library over here. He says, oh, they're in the house. It's like being at recess. Anything goes. And he loved chaos. I didn't like chaos. I, I wanted to know exactly what we were doing and, you know, and down the line. But but nevertheless, uh, th those are, are the years that I served in the legislature. And, being, well, being a Democrat in a Republican state, mm -hmm. it's probably tough. And then being a Democrat in a Republican county, it's probably tough. How do you get things done so well? I, I think I've, I'm, I'm good at working across the aisle. When I was in, in, the, in the Arizona State Senate in, in 91, 92, I became the first Latino president of the Arizona Senate in the history of the state of Arizona. Wow. Not the first, awesome. first and only, because nobody else has done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I was able to get folk to support me for president. And the only way you do it is by getting the other 29 senators, or the majority of them, to vote for you yeah. to be president. So I figured, you know what, if I could succeed in, in, in getting them to support me for president, it, I can succeed at anything. And I just started reaching across the aisle where other Democrats wouldn't. Like some Republicans at that time wouldn't reach across the aisle for Democratic support. Now they don't, but back then they would. Uh, but I, I made that part of, of Pete Rios. I, I'm going to be bipartisan. I can work with anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. I mean, if I could get along with Russell Pierce at the time, <laughs> I could get along with anybody. I mean, the majority of Latinos and the majority of Democrats hated Russell Pierce. Pierce was a passion. And they would ask me, why do you still talk to him? I mean, why are you nice to him? I said, he's a human being to begin with. And I said, secondly, he's got his principles. You know, the guy takes his positions because he believes in what he believes. Well, he was a deputy sheriff, right? And he was in Guadalupe. And he went to the park. There's a whole bunch of Yaki and, and Mexican kids there, and he got into a hassle with the kids, and he started wrestling over his gun, and they shot his finger off. Okay. And that's one thing, reason that I know he was he's not very fond of minorities and, and Latino. Then his son, who was years, years later, a deputy, he went to serve some papers at some trailer court up in the Mesa area, and he got shot through the door, right in the chest. They didn't know whether he was going to live or not. So I know where he's coming from. I mean, if, if somebody of a particular group did that to mine, eh, I probably wouldn't be too fond of them either. I mean, I would tolerate it, but he didn't. So I, I knew where he was coming from. So I, I kind of, and, and a lot of it goes back to, to my education. Having been in sociology, taking 
hundreds of hours in psychology. Dealing I, with complex families that don't get along. Absolutely. So I, I can understand people and I, and I can work with people. I can tell you, having been here a year and nine months as the sheriff and working with the board, you know, four Republicans and, and you being the lone mm -hmm. Democrat, I can always say that I, f I find you to be one of the most consistent members of the board. And you, I know, I, I usually have a pretty good idea what your values are, and I appreciate that you stick to those values. And I think you represent very well the people of the Copper Corridor. Uh, I, you're a good voice for them, and I know you work hard for them. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Copper Corridor, what are some of the things that you would like to see moving forward as far as progression in it? And how can we in law enforcement, how can the Sheriff's Office help you in your district? Well... Answering your last question first, I, I think since you came into office, I think this office has been more responsive to that area, the east side of the county, than the previous administration, because the previous administration removed a lot of the deputies, brought them down to Santan Valley, and even though we could use more deputies in the area, at least the response time has been reduced. Uh, people feel that you all are available, and they appreciate that. So I think you're providing more services to the, that area that, that, than they had seen in the previous four years. But the, the Copper Corridor, unlike this part of my county, the central uh, Pinal County area of Florence Colegio, is very different because here you have the infrastructure. Especially Eloy and Coolidge, they got Interstate 10, Interstate 8, Union Pacific Railroad, a lot of things happening there. I mean, a lot of growth and development that's going to come into the area. Unlike the Copper Corridor, we have one road, one highway in, one highway out, and that's State Route 77. So when you try to attract other businesses, they're looking at, like, oh, how do we move product out of here? We, you got a two lane highway, you know, so that really, really limits. What we can do. We've been focusing on ecotourism, which has helped because we have, our country is beautiful up there in the mountain area with rivers, with the Arrow Viper Creek. Uh, we've got a lot of different birds that uh, come through there and settle in there, and we've we got, got a lot of bio bird dome. launchers. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize Biosphere, biodome is, yeah. Biosphere is in yeah. your, uh, your area. It's in that district, and now we've recently got a very popular attraction there, which is the zip lines yeah. in, in Oracle. I mean, they're booked for months in advance. Uh, so, so that's a good attraction. And then we also have the uh, San Carlos Apache tribe that moved in and, and brought a small casino to the area, which I'm, I'm hoping that they can develop further so that they can attract more traffic off State Route 77, especially the people from Tucson and, and that area. As they're going up to the White Mountains for fishing, camping, or in the winter, you know, for for skiing, that they'll pull off. But the casino doesn't have a nice restaurant yet. And that's what I've told the the chairman of the tribe. I said, if you don't have a place for people to eat and they don't want to gamble, there's no reason right. for them to come off the highway and come up here. It's only less, of, you know, roughly a little over a quarter mile to get to the casino. And... Uh, they're, they're just not there yet. There's some issues with the quality of water, not the quantity of water. And I think they need to put in a water treatment plant before it grows more than that. They need a Vegas-style buffet. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be up there for a yeah. Vegas-style buffet. Well, what, are you, what, do you have, what kind of message do you have for the people of Pinal County and for uh, your district? What is your message that you'd like to get across to them? I think that Pinal County is ideally located between what I used to call the two-headed monster. Two-headed monster being Maricopa and Pima County. And back then, 20, 25 years ago, I wasn't sure whether that was a blessing or a curse. And back then, it was a curse because nobody came to Pinal County. They all went to Pima or Maricopa County because that's where the urban centers were located. I'm finding now that we are ideally located and it's a blessing now because Maricopa and Pima County have about hit their limits 
and people are discovering, and when I say people, companies, corporations are discovering Pinal County. They're wanting to come here. They're wanting to locate here. And when you get companies like Lucid Motors yeah. that wants to invest, and they just got a billion dollars from the Saudis to invest in Pinal County for their plans for electric uh, battery powered vehicles. When you have companies like Nicola that wants to locate in Coolidge, but in reality it's Eloy because they're further <laughs> down, but it's, it's part of incorporated uh, city of Coolidge. And they're going to manufacture semi-tractor trailer rigs that are again um, driverless in many cases, but it's, it's a thing of the future, but they're coming in. There's going to be a growth in the Eloy Poolage area that nobody I is agree. expecting. That's why we need to get busy and win this lawsuit that's been filed against um, the voters of Pinal County for the half cent on the Regional Transportation yeah. Authority because we need to start developing the the north-south corridor that would run from Apache Junction through Florence, through Coolidge, through Picacho, and connect with Interstate 10. And that's what we want to use some of those monies for. But the Goldwater Institute filed a lawsuit that the language was not clear, and uh, there was a tax attorney or tax judge in Maricopa County that agreed with them. So we're in the process of appealing that yeah. to the appellate court and hope to get a favorable ruling so that we can start um, funding some of these projects that we need to fund it in Pinal County. You know, I had a lot of people that said, ah, why, are you, why are you for this uh, regional transit? I said, look, we need better roads. We had 26 fatalities last year. Mm -hmm. Because of this eight that we had recently, we're probably going to exceed it this year. And so we have to have better roadways in this county. What I was for was putting it in front of the voter. And what we did was, as, as county officials, we put an opt option in front of the voters. None of the officials were the ones that passed this. It's That's the right. voters that passed That's this. That's what I'm saying. The voters wanted better roadways. So hopefully that will get resolved because I agree, there's some good things coming to the county, and we need the infrastructure and the roadways to be able to accommodate these big businesses that want to come. Yeah. The, the, only, the only restriction that we may encounter in Pinal County and it's getting to be more real as time goes by, is water. Yeah. Water will dictate the size of Pinal County. I still envision in five to 10 years, probably 10 years, this county will be pushing a million people in population. I agree. But I think water may put a limit on how big we can grow. I think water will put a limit on a lot of our farming and ranching currently, and, and we're facing that right now because we, we need to work with the other states that take CAP water, and that's something that the governor and some other folk are working on to see if we can come to some resolution on that because the first ones that get cut off in terms of farming is Pinal County. So that's, right. that's an issue we always have to keep in the back of our minds. Well, Supervisor Rios, thank sure. you for having us today. Thank you for thank having me. Thank you for me. all your service to the state and to the county. Uh, I know the area, the people in your area are, are lucky to have a, a representative that cares so much for their district. Uh, I know that Pete does. I've seen it firsthand. So appreciate thank you it. for what you do and for your support of the sheriff's office. Absolutely. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to working with you for a long time more. So Excellent. thanks for coming in today and taking the time. You've heard it, podcast here with Supervisor Rios. I'm sure we'll have him back in the future, but uh, God bless everybody. Take care and uh, remember, just do right. Thank you.